Welcome everybody. My name is Awasar. I'm Assistant Director for Academic Affairs at the, Africa, the African Studies Center at Michigan State University. And this is our weekly seminary series, Eye on Africa. And we're very delighted to have Dr. Paul Kimoto as our guest speaker today. Before I pass the floor to him, a brief introduction. Professor Paul Kimoto is a crop science specialist majoring in crop physiology and breeding from Egerton University, Kenya. He is also a professor in the Faculty of Agriculture and Director of Marketing, Resource Mobilization, and Agroscience Park at Egerton University. Prof professor Kimoto is a dry land research expert with research interests in crop stress physiology, impact of climate change on crop production, climate smart crops, and seed systems for enhancing resilience, food and nutritional security in harsh dry lands. As a researcher, he has published widely in a number of research areas of interest, including crop physiology, breeding, crop production and protection, seed science and climate smart agricultural technologies. Support for his research has come from strong partnership and collaboration from CGIAR centers, mainly IPRISAT, which has facilitated funding from USAID Feed the Future program, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa, Generation Ch Challenge Program, and FAO, among others. We're very happy to have you with us, uh, Professor Kamata. Welcome. Pleasure. Thank you, Awa, and uh, good evening, colleagues. Uh, good morning and good, good evening. I am um, Paul Kimurso from Egerton University. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to talk on the I on Africa today under the AAP program. And uh, my topic will be on the role of innovative tech agricultural technologies in sustainable food systems and food base building among the poor resource so smallholder farmers in Africa and drylands. I will use the case of Kenya, Kenya drylands, to do my presentation and give examples on some of the work that we've been doing uh, with colleagues at Egerton University uh, for some time now. If you allow me, I can share my presentation uh, and continue to talk about um, the work that we've been doing. As Awa said, um, we, this opportunity has been actually um, made available through collaboration with one of my colleagues, um, Dr. Miriam Jarimpu, who got some scholarship to go to Michigan State University under the invitation of Dr. Susan Wish and um, in the Department of Information in Media and Information. So I'm grateful for that um, scholarship that brought me to get an opportunity to talk today. My presentation will include a brief introduction on the African drylands, some nexus on between the climate change and productivity and conflicts in the dryland of Kenya and Africa, the impacts of drought on food systems in Africa, our approaches, what we try to do on the agricultural technologies, some selected examples. I talk about the summary of our implementation pathway and some few case studies of selected projects. And I'll, at the end, I give some concluding remarks. For those of us who don't know Africa, Africa is um, one of the biggest continents globally, and it has very large dry land. It contributes about covers its dry land. You can see the whole of red area. Everywhere red, it shows that it gets very minimal rainfall. Sixty percent of the continent is is actually um, dry land, with almost 0.5 billion people living here, of the total of 2.4 billion globally, and therefore communities in 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 African dry land face a lot of challenges, livelihood challenges. They lag behind in many of the achievements in the 17 uh, sustainable goals than in any other part of the world. The sub-Saharan Africa is more serious. 
uh, and because we, it is estimated that they will have a lot of additional problems in, in the future. So by 2020, there will be a lot of nutritional problems in the African food systems. There are 20,000 pastoralists who live in these areas. And these pastoralists depend mainly on livestock or livestock products as income and food. And therefore, they graze the animals communally in open areas. And therefore, anytime they, there is drought, there is no capability of investment. The other agro-pastoralists also would live on 50% of their income from non-livestock, which is mainly crops of the dryland. The total population of the dryland communities is around 30 million in the greater own of Africa. And these areas are highly affected by drought. This area includes Kenya, where we are, Somalia, all the way to the Southern Africa. And therefore, when you check the milligrams of water per hectare found in these areas, the African continent is actually highly deprived of water. Kenya, on the other side, on the other hand, is also facing a lot of challenges. You can see that most of the Kenyan area is arid, semi-arid, 80%, all of this area, 23 counties, the 50 million people, around uh, 18 million, live in the red areas, and this some pit covering most of the coastal central Kenya. Therefore, Kenya's population is always under high risk of food because of drought. And there is even currently for the last two, three years in some counties, we've never received enough rainfall. And because communities depend on rainfall for food and water, they are always under high risk. The, these areas are also highly degraded. The aridity index is very high. The amount of water available per household, per cubic meters by year per person is very low, 800 to 1300, compared to more than two, three, 2,000 meter cubic, um, cubic meters of water per person by, by year in many of the areas. The impact is seen here by this community in Trukana, a photo I took some time back. The, Population look very old, but it is in bearing, childbearing age. So you can see this is because of the major impact on primary productivity, for, that is pasture, and nitrogen, nitrogen cycling, which is actually highly related to fertility and even the nutrient availability for the communities. So reduced productivity of the dryland, carbon sequestration is high, but the impact on human population, especially the sustainable development goals. Number one, very high poverty, very high hunger. We say zero hunger, but in, in these communities, the hunger levels is very high. There is also serious challenges on education and gender because most of the communities that are affected are women. So the, the there is need to address um, issues using technology in the dry lands. And there are three nexus, three key factors. When you see this slide, you realize that the conflict is a large conflict between productivity and, and conflict. The poor rainfall distribution reduces seasonality of pasture. You can see in this photo, this is wet season. When the, if the rainfall remains wet like this throughout the year, the livestock remain very healthy. There is continuous supply of water and there is no migration. Communities settle down and there is continuous supply of food and they, they never migrate. When the environment changes slightly to be dry like this, most of the livestock, the small livestock remain. The large livestock migrate into the highlands like in this area. These are the highlands of the, of the, of the Rift Valley. The communities go there, 500 to 1,000 livestock per household. They go feed on farmers' crops. In the end, there is conflict. They also even move to the national game reserves. In the process, they take diseases and even eat what the wildlife are, are supposed to feed on. And therefore, they go into conservancies. They create conflict among uh, the other investors. Such, when the environment is very dry, like here, these livestock begin to die. So the, the drivers of 
the nexus between productivity and conflict is rainfall and pasture productivity, livestock productivity as they decline, the communities will have to move around to look for their pasture. So the migration in search of pasture results in increased livestock conflict. We are seeing this in many of the drylands of Africa. There is also a serious nexus between climate change and food yields or food productivity. The climate change reduces the major cereals and legumes grown by communities in the drylands. You can see in this photo, this is what happens when there is very little moisture. The soils crack. This was a, a sorghum field in one of the drylands in, in, in Turkana. And this was a maize. Uh, this was beans that we had grown in one of the dryland areas in Kenya, in Laikipia. Productivity decreases by 30 to 60 percent. And the, calor the calorie by year has been estimated to be very low. There is a high reduction, about 1% to sometimes 2% reduction in food calorie by year. The key food products like sorghum, millet, groundnut, pigeon pea, and therefore malnutrition arises. So there is human migration. In Kenya, for example, now we are seeing a lot of migration from Sudan and Somalia, not because of conflict, but because of lack of food. So there is high number of people in Kagoma, refugee camp, the highest uh, refugee in East African region with around half a million refugees. People move because of lack of food. The livestock are also migrating within the grazing lands and also between Kenya, Uganda, and even between Sudan and Kenya. In the process, there are conflicts. So this is the numbers of um, uh, a publication from ACD 2018. In Africa, you can see the conflicts, deaths, the number of fatalities. It was very high in 2011 in Kenya, and you could see also in Africa. When it was almost 2,250 2, in Kenya, in the whole Africa, it was around 2,700. And then it declined. This, if you look at the rainfall patterns and productivity in the drylands, these are areas, the times when there is no, there is no pasture or rainfall may have failed for half a year or even for all the seasons of crop productivity. And then it declined in 2013, 2014 there. Uh, and then it started again in 2015 to maybe more than, it's almost the same number. In Kenya, it went slightly below um, 200, actually two, 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 2011 was, around 240, 2015, 250, and then it came down, then went again around 2019, and it has gone up. The numbers now have gone up in 2022 because of conflict. The dry land areas are increasing. So Kenya contributes a large number of fatalities, especially in the Kerio Valley, the northern part of Kenya. So this is, these are areas where we've been thinking of contributing uh, in terms of reducing um, food insecurity and technologies that can alleviate um, some of these fatalities arising from conflicts. Uh, this is um, what is happening in food systems in, in Africa. In 2020, more than one in five people in Africa faced hunger, more than double in any other region. And the dry land contributes more than 60% of food deficit compared to the urban poor settlements, which has been estimated to be less than 39%. So the dry lands should be the focus of investments to reduce the overall food insecurity in Africa. So the overall food insecurity in Africa is driven by the dry, is a dry land. Sometimes people say urban settlements, but it may not be the case. I think it is in the dry lands. So food security declines by 15 to 20% in Kenya every time there is drought or flood event. And you can see the projections by 2020, it is happening now. This was a publication of 2020, 2019 by the World Bank. It is true, Eastern and Southern Africa need a lot of money to feed its population. And uh, it is actually due to a combination of these factors, drought, poverty, conflicts, high food prices, which we are experiencing because of wars outside Africa, displacement, poor trade within the African continent, which is very serious, even within Kenya itself, trade in food. Sometimes there is excess in the, in the high production areas and there is very little 
in the drylands, and of course, environmental degradation. So these are some of the investment areas that African governments and investors and even researchers should focus on. Our work has been focusing mainly on this drought resilience and some bit of seeing whether we can contribute to reduce conflict by our, our strategy. So what, have been, what has been our goal? The Global Center on Adaptation 2021 outlined priorities for public sector investment in Africa to build resilience among small-scale farmers, pastoralists, and SMEs in the dialogue. They looked at five, six key areas. One, research and extension is the key driver because the technologies in the drylands arise, arising from climate change should be innovative. They should not be the traditional livestock or traditional ways of the farmers, the way the communities have been doing. Water management is key, infrastructure, roads mainly, and network and even communication, ICT, uh, entry so that farmers can be educated, land restoration, and climate information services. So the goal of our work has been to see whether we can deploy climate smart agricultural technologies, validating the climate smart agricultural uh, technologies, because we may develop them in our research. But if we don't take them to for adaptation and adoption among the small scale farmers, then we will never know whether they will be of any use. And generating and availing climate smart knowledge, this, this has been an, actually a big contribution from the National Meteorological Station, uh, Research Station. And therefore, we've been working closely with CALRO to ensure that some of the technologies are delivered through the ICT systems and enhancing the the climate smart information, strengthening the market inefficiencies through farmer organizations, which are proved to be very, very, uh, very strong. And one way of increasing the resilience is to enhance aggregation of what farmers produce for the purpose of even increasing and accessing markets. But there is one statement here that is very strong. Financing and adaptation and resilience to climate change is far much better than disaster relief and recovery. We've seen quite a number of NGOs going into the communities, supplying food, oils, and uh, relief food, and providing recovery. But sustainability of that is always not happening. So the most sustainable strategy is financing adaptation and resilience. Adaptation from agricultural technologies and resilience from diversifying uh, what the communities can do. So our overarching approach has been to um, look at some few impacts. Example, our expected impacts have been to check whether high yielding varieties that are better resilient to drought and pasture can be adopted. This is through efficient breeding technologies that we deployed, uh, starting using conventional breeding, marker selection breeding, and also in collaboration to check whether we can introduce nutritious components into these varieties. Validate them to enhance productivity and make sure that we have a preferred seed system because uh, one of the biggest problems in the dry land is lack of private sector investment. Seed companies, agro, uh, agro, um, agro input dealers are not interested in these small scale, low profit, or even sometimes difficulty in conflict areas and insecurity. So seed systems is one of the things that we've seen is very, very, and it has been published extensively by FAO and even AGRA in, in, in this region. So on-farm productive landscapes is also very important because this is one way of enhancing soil and water retention. Food value chain linkages has also been one of the key things because facilitated aggregation and end-to-end -end produce delivery systems and post-harvest losses reduction is one of the key things because in the dry lands, pests and diseases, mainly pests, both post-harvest and on-farm pests are very serious. And of course, um, um, the, 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 the weevils, the stock borers, many of these are very, very aggressive. That's the species that are more difficult and more uh, even challenging to control 
are found in the drylands. And then, of course, the weather support, I've mentioned about that. And then, of course, we try to ensure that Kenya penetration in ICT is very strong. So when you even go to communities in the drylands, you see them having a phone, and there is possibility of getting to know uh, the weather warning systems from the med stations. And therefore, that has been one of the packages that we deliver as we train them on adaptation of varieties. And then, of course, increased resilience, food and food security among the household so that you can have increased security and also ensuring that uh, farmers uh, or Banta communities don't migrate. So we have been looking at some few regions in Kenya. I talked about this is Kenya, for those who don't know. We are in the Eastern Africa, bordering Ethiopia, Somalia here, Uganda, Tanzania are our partners. And then, of course, within the East African Community Block, we have uh, Burundi, Rwanda, Congo on the other side. And also Ethiopia is joining in. So the areas where these are already indicated, the most difficult areas are the north. And these are the areas where, of course, it's very difficult to work at in. But we've been focusing on areas that are around our university, which is in the central part of the country. So we've been looking at some nine counties in small wards or in small areas where uh, we have strong collaboration with, with the extension staff. And some of the are in the Rift Valley, this region here, the Laikipia, uh, Geomaraquet, Baringo, and Tukana. Tukana is the farthest one. And then Nyeri and Laikipia in the central part, and parts of Tarakanithi. And also in the eastern part, you look at Ekitui, parts of um, uh, Taitan Tavetal towards the coast, and Makueni. The report covers, or rather my talk covers some several collaborative projects, which has taken, uh, picked some examples for the last eight, nine, 10 years. And we looked at a total number of around 100 to 150 to around 255,000 farmers that we may have interacted to several uh, groups and uh, projects directly or indirectly. And it involves several uh, teams and collaborators like ICRESAT, CALRO, ASAREKA, Climate Trust, and support from several donors like the USID and even um, AGRA and other, and other donor agencies. The target groups, crops have been two, of course, mainly two, two types that are adapted in the drylands. The finger millet, that is a, this group of the dryland cereals and the group of the dryland legumes. The finger millet is a traditional African crop which is um, it has a um, center of um, origin to be in East Africa. And as the name suggests, you can see these fingers. So the millet is very strong traditional crop uh, that is mainly um, grown in the drylands and also in the medium altitude areas. The sorghum is well known globally. It's also one of the crops we've been working on. The palm millet looks like this. It's also a crop that is grown in the tropics. And the pigeon peas, the peanut is grown across the globe, the beans and the cow peas. We have other crops that like the, the pasture here. This is one of the species, African foxtail, the Syncra ciliari species is the one of the species that we've also been promoting as integration between pasture and, um, and crops because of agropastoralism in the drylands. The, the approach has been, it's just that graphic uh, approach. What do we do? We do system analysis. The system analysis is to understand what is in the communities. So transitional readiness assessment on gender, nutrient analysis of soil, we look at analytics in terms of market, we look at the ecosystem, what farmers do, and we understand their, their, their culture. Then we look at, after we engage, we need, now need to, look, to do niche experimenting and piloting. This is very important because in this process, you introduce technologies which are highly specific in the community. I mean, transform from research and then you do 
piloting, and then you check whether in the process you do capacity building, you see whether there is any business opportunity for the youth, and in the process you check on seed system development, restoration of possi potential possibilities of technologies for the restoring the degraded systems, and increasing dual purpose crops like sorghum and groundnuts, old farm, and in most cases you invest a lot to get the, the, the monitoring and evaluation research to ensure that what you get the feedback from there, from this is very important because from here you reduce the activity and select the technology that you know it fits into the community. Then, of course, you will be looking at post harvest, you train on post harvest, you enhance and look at the entrepreneurial potential, and then you go into go in innovation and scaling up. It is at this level that. Uh, the counties and investment can go into. You also bring the private sector to see whether they can be aggregators or buyers, or they can be input suppliers, or they uh, they they can come in and also um, buy buy pasture, or they bring in any of the inputs that have been identified from the innovation. So this indirectly is actually the scaling up, and in the process we in invest quite a bit on the organizational learning and also governance where we inform the county governments to participate in areas where there is possibility of commercialization. We look at, this is the implementation and delivery pathway. For example, um, we look at um, crop improvement activities where we have variety development and key assessment of the key two key stress factors in the dry land, basically biotic and biotic stress factors, and then multi end use preference like varieties for food, for the feeding, and even malting. Malting is uh, for traditional beer because um, some of the African communities don't buy uh, the, the, the commercial beer. They prepare their own traditional brews, so they need to have either good quality varieties, either in terms of finger millet or even the maize or so on. So those are some of the traits that should not be lost. We, so we invest in looking at the jamplasm and also understanding what communities need. In terms of research and um, on-farm validation, like in this case, you can see women here in Turkana, we, be, we are training them on how to do um, groundnut work. And you can only see the only women because there are social beliefs which you should not actually ignore because men in some of the communities in Africa, like the Tukana here, is that they never farm. So they just escort their women to the farm and their work is to take care of livestock. So you can never also mix them. The women cannot be mixed with women. If the men cannot be mixed with women when they are in the farm and therefore they, they only escort them to the farm and they stay away. Like they are standing here with their sons you will not participate in the farm. So you cannot train them uh, together to adopt that technology because it will not work because the men will then have a negative uh, impact on the technology you are trying to do. So building up capacity of the value chain actors, focusing on women and youth and extension. And the resilience I've talked about comes from the several things that come in, the value addition to increase, to increase food and the utilization, Organization is also very key because some of these crops uh, cannot be, uh, they can be harvested using hand, but threshing and even cleaning require mechanization, small equipments. So we look at that in the process and also bring in SMEs or private sector partners to work on some of the equipment. And of course, talked about seed delivery enterprises. Some of these farmers are plant quarter acre, very small area. So we need to package the seed in small quantities so, so that even when they want to buy, uh, or even when the private sector wants to sell, they sell in quantities that the farmers can afford. And of course, at the end of the day, uh, we need community seed banks because any new variety cannot be sustained from um, a research point of view. It must be retained and produced in the community. So I, I want to just show this. This is a case example of uh, Lycipia and Nyeri where we worked on drought tolerant beans uh, to introduce it for purposes of food and feed. And you can see the first thing you do is training about the technology. You also go into evaluation here where you come and bring 
the variety, several of them, and you now check the performance and the farmer select. And after that, this is you do it yourself. Next time you introduce them to do, and then you scale it up. And then eventually, even as they harvest here, yeah, you, you also still engage them to know how to do post harvest. This may, this diagram is a complete one, but it, is, it involves a lot because some of these farmers may not even know good agronomic, agronomic practices. So you introduce seed rates, you do on-farm and the demonstrations, you introduce nitrogen inoculums, and you can see the difference between the biofix, the nitrogen inoculums, the plant densities, you bring in chemicals in the process, teach them how to give records. And then later on, when they are now producing in large scales like here, every farmer will may have planted one acre. Now they say, yes, the variety is good, the product is good, where is the market? So you need to look at a reduction in exploitation because every time there is increase in productivity in the, in the villages or in communities, the brokers come in to exploit the farmers and they buy in small quantities. But in the end, some of these uh, engagements will actually um, enable women to have increased nutritious foods. They will also create jobs for the youth because some of them will be involved in organization. Others will be involved in spraying for the spraying for the fields for the for the farmers, and this project has been very successful. Uh, we've been involved in it because it was funded by World Bank. It's called Kenya Climate Smart Project, and we've been supporting several counties, and we've seen a lot of impact in several value chains. This is uh, one of them. This is still a demonstration of what we did. Um, you can see uh, same photo, different photos different activities and the different pharma groups with our, our, our team in the, in, 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 the, in the training session. So eventually the scaling up, if a farmer has two, three acres of such a quality or this quality or this quality, you can be sure that the yield productivity increases significantly. So we, we saw this as a replacement of local varieties we, and local traditional activities with our technologies. We did a baseline in some of these two counties on the beans. Initially, they were producing 150 to 225 kilograms per hectare, which is one to two bags. By the end of two years, the yield productivity had increased by almost 166% because farmers had gone to 700 kilos per hectare. So the cross margins also increased significantly. These are some of the farmers numbers in every, some of the wards we were working on. Although during the process, like in this area, like Olmoran area, our project was disrupted by conflicts because there was also the drought in the other part of the West Pocot and the Kerio Valley River area. The communities, the, the Hadas or the pastoralists invaded the area and we lost most of the project area and even the communities got discouraged because of the insecurity that came in. But eventually, anyway, some of the improved varieties that were adopted by the farmers were well documented. But we saw the key drivers are innovations around variety, the knowledge, soil management, water conservation, seed rates, weather information, post harvest, and market linkage establishments. This is an example of um, um, Kerio Valley. This is an example of Kerio Valley, where we worked in the three Kerio Valley counties. This is one of the areas in, in Kenya where you hear a lot of insecurity. The triangle between Turkana County, West Pokot, Elgeo Marakwet, and Baringo, and Samburu areas, this is where the Catarastic menace is very serious. So we engage in the Kerio Valley Triangle, mixed communities, farmers, pastoralists, and natural pastoralists for a period of four year project. And we actually went in looking at crop livestock integration uh, with strong, we had a, a good project with um, ICRISAT, and we introduced dual purpose cereals and legumes, and we looked at pasture management, especially the African foxtail and land reclamation strategies. And you will see some of the engagements of the farmers here. Over the hills the other side, 
they are large scale farmers and on the lowlands we have now the pastoralist pastoralist and agro pastoralists uh, engaged in these areas also we have uh, morans the youth who after circumcision the activity is not to do anything else but to look at livestock and increase the number of livestock for marriage so the integration of these technologies especially the the involvement with morans diversify the communities for, so that you can get pastoralists agro pastoralists and pure crop farmers became very very useful because the 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 crops that we took took care of everybody they could get integration between maize sorghum pigeon pea and intercrops and they would also get um, even women producing pasture under a closed system for them to sell seed and even feed their their small livestock that have remained back home when the men move away with a large number of livestock increasing in there in the other um, large large rangelands where there is more pasture when drought comes in the in the lower areas of the where the communities live so the the integrating youth especially um, the ones that are mainly dealing with pastoralists and bringing in other crops that can do well in this community and you can create market takes away conflicts in a very large scale and of course the landscape rehabilitation took place because some of the pasture here are more biomass productivity compared with their poverty grass which grows within a very short time and the, 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 the landscape is exposed and all the water is lost. Some of the high yielding uh, pigeon pea also here are, stays in the farm for more than one season. They are attuned and the, the, the community can get extra vegetables in terms of, of food. This is uh, the natural growing poverty grass as compared to the African foxtail, which gives three to five times better the yield as compared to this grass where the livestock grazes within a short time and all of it is grown when it dries. But the advantage of poverty grass is that it germinates, it regerminates within three weeks after rainfall starts. So it is one of the uh, resilient um, natural species, traditional African species, but the challenge is that it doesn't produce enough for the increasing uh, livestock for the farmer. So you could see here um, three things. The pasture itself, the fodder silage, including a dual purpose variety called IE12991, which is available here, very tall, and it has good, good biomass. And of course, uh, increasing the range land. And when you look at even um, bailing this pasture, increasing the, or rather training the communities to bail, bail this pasture instead of just opening them to be grazed, open grazing and conserved grazing so that you build this for the next season, it generated quite a lot of income for, for the communities, which is quite different from um, uh, open grazing. So you could see some of the farmers started doing um, conservation, preservation and conservation of fodder for the drought season, which is always between January and March in Kenya. So this, this is one of the actually um, activities that we thought it brought a lot of peace because of increased availability of pasture and declining or reduced migration of the, of the communities. We did a publication in the Journal of Arid Dryland and it's available on the impact of determinants of quality um, pasture in terms of conflict resolution. And we, the communities were very, very eager to get a solution on what type of pasture can be conserved and can produce better biomass that can actually reduce their movement because it affects them as you move into the other farmlands. The African tropical cereals is, is one of the important crops I think I've already mentioned, but these are new to cereals mainly the millets I've talked about. 
and also the sorghums. We did some quite a bit of work trying to introduce them in the drylands, and we, we saw success, uh, especially on the finger millet, the pearl millet, and the sorghums. These cereals are uh, very, they do very well in harsh and hot rainfall, and also in poor soil conditions, and uh, it provides um, uh, additional, or rather, apart from the, the, nutri the nutritious components of calcium, magnesium, and iron in the grain, they also assist in provision of additional uh, crop residues for the livestock, which is a key component of the agro-pastoralism in the dry areas. They also have good storage ability. They can stay for more than 10 years without being eaten by weevils because the grains are very small. There is no aflatoxin as compared to cereals like maize and soga and then um, and other uh, large cereals, they also have gluten and they have low gluten. So the release of the energy is very slow. You eat, um, the pastoralists consume it. They can go for more than three quarters of a day without feeling hungry. And of course, they have biological value and medicinal value. They also have very good malting qualities, I already mentioned, and winning food for infant, infant babies. So we worked on one of the projects to look at um, how to increase productivity using several breeding technologies, traditional and molecular approaches in collaboration with ICRISAT. And we eventually developed a variety that had very low um, parenchyma cells, which allows women instead of, because finger millet is obviously using knives, so we got one that had got brittle um, stems because of a traditional selection from the community that it was very low yielding, but with brittle neck, brittle barangaima cells, which you can just break using hands. So we backcross that with a tradition with a high yielding variety, and we retained the using the maca assisted backcross to integrate um, the snapping trait into a high yielder and eventually get what we call a snapping variety, which you can just harvest without using a knife. And that was very popular among women because it, you could easily harvest it without breaking. And in this photo, you can see uh, that that product was very good. And we actually had um, some few publications that indicated that there, there, there was quite a, a good output in terms of a technology that can assist women to reduce drudgery. We also had some activity in Trucana on uh, looking at the traditional Trucana uh, jamplasm. And we looked at um, this county together with FAO because we realized it is one of the counties which is the driest and worst hit by drought. So the strategy was to check uh, whether there is a legume and a sorghum as a source of food and a legume that can be a source of protein. Because the earlier photo I showed, even you, when you look at children in the fields here, and even these um, the people, the old men in the community, they have a lot of malnutrition. So one of the uh, approaches is to look at um, their local varieties, which they have been growing for a very long period of time, because they have several characteristics. One is that you can consume the whole crop. You can consume the, the stem because it has high sugar content. You can boil the, the grain and it is very sweet. It has very sh high sugar content and you can eat it as, as, as uh, fresh in the farm. So they, 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 they fight poverty also uh, using very different uh, ways. So in the farm, when it is at milk stage, uh, they just harvest it and eat it in the field, the way uh, we were collecting the jamplas in here. So this is, we collected this, took it to our um, recurrent selection breeding, selected the best, cleaned the material, and took it back to the community. And you could see some of the materials that we, we actually caught back, and eventually the yield and income for the farmers increased 666. Significantly. And then one of the challenges we faced was um, uh, what happens 
with germplasm conservation when you continue doing selection. So there is always a risk of losing mixed population among the farmers and the breeding to select yield and specific traits. So that is one of the challenges that as you continue selecting and uh, increasing the yield, you are losing genetic diversity. This is uh, an example that we also did in um, Tarakani, Eastern Kenya. This crop is called pearl millet. It's also one of the African traditional crops, um, which is very good in terms of uh, food security, more adapted in the Eastern Kenya, the Tarakani the area is bordering the not the, the the southern the north south part of Kenya, where you go to Isholo and uh, towards uh, um, Ethiopia. So, as compared to the northern part where we have more sorghum and finger millet, this area has got more pearl millet as one of the stable food crops. So, one of the challenges we faced here is batch, is batch. So we had uh, to look at uh, what. Do, how do we protect the bird damage? So we went into selection of brittle varieties. You can see this one. So the brittle varieties, punctures when the bird wants to eat, it actually injury inches the, the eyes of the birds. So the farmers no need to even, uh, they, so they, they, there is no need for the farmers to actually go and they do bird scaring. So this is one of the innovations that when we introduced it, the reduction of 20 to 30 percent bad damage, which also if you, if you scare it using a labor, you incur a lot of costs. So uh, one of the outputs is to look for, uh, or rather we selected, we identified uh, local accessions, actually introductions from uh, India, which had very good traits on uh, the brittleness of the of the heads, the spikes. We also looked at the grain quality and ana analysis, and uh, we did the willingness to buy when small millers processed it into flour uh, and other fortified products with legumes. And there was um, a nice publication on what are the impacts in terms of the food value chain when you fortify some of these adding into, when you fortify adding legumes like green grams or the mung bean, then you eventually have a better value product, but the cost goes up. Goes up. So that, this is one of the, and the other challenge we had also was the head smarts, which we looked at the, the resistant sources and we found um, some bit of uh, varieties that we, it could go to the farmers. This is a food safety challenge, which is also one of the problems we saw in Kenya, especially when you introduce groundnuts, because aflatoxin is serious, mainly in the drylands, and uh, it's affecting uh, most of these crops, including the palm millet and groundnuts. So it, the contamination poses high risk and reduces market opportunities for farmers. So this has been one of the challenges that we've been trying to encourage farmers to practice for harvest because there is no solution for harvest losses and also um, aflatoxin uh, problems like this. You can see this is a clean crop, but when aflatoxin grows on it, 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 it is actually rejected mainly because of the um, toxicity levels. And you know exports, the 10 billion parts, the 10 parts per billion for export of most of the uh, food crops is not allowable beyond other countries. This is an example of uh, the pigeon pea, it's a legume which I talked about. We found it to be very, very important in terms of its uh, rehabilitative nature, uh, vegetable production in the drylands, and also for the production for livestock, and its ability to be grown in stony areas. But we had several challenges. We had issues around photoperiodism. We also had issues around a pesticide, that is the insect pest, and also issues around 
adaptability by farmers. So eventually we did uh, selection and had photobiotic sens insensitive varieties because the lower you go, the more the heat unit and the more vegetative some of the varieties respond to. And they don't produce flowers and then farmers will never adopt it. So we had to, to, to screen for photobiotic insensitivity first and then looking at maturity periods because some of the farmers would want to intercrop and harvest within a short time and then allow the crop to ratoon. So cropping systems, it was one of the things that we looked at and analyzed, especially looking at the phenotypic and genetic variation against the board borers, together with inclusion of women for nutrition and even old people for nutrition. So this, we have several number of varieties that we have actually delivered to cities, communities, and some of the outputs if you check on these um, impacts, is uh, several numbers of seed produced, the female and male that we engage in across some of these communities, and even the volume and amount of income that were earned am among the target group. We didn't work with every time we engage, we don't engage everybody because you stay with the community for more than three, four years before you get to see the impact. So the, diversif the diversification away from livestock dependence was one of the key things that we saw. The introduction of market linkage and of takers, we had one, two, two private sector engagements with the green forest, groundnut, and also Insta food was one of the good examples. Uh, and most of the incomes that came from this, because the, the farmers in Kenya still eat maize. You could see them, selling a goat, they go and buy maize. But now you can see them selling millet, groundnuts, and sorghum go and buy maize. So there was diversification in resilience and they could preserve most of their livestock for purposes of uh, maybe now paying school fees and also increasing uh, their livelihood and, and survival. So this, this um, is, um, Another case, just an example of, of uh, Turkana I've talked about, but this photo is very interesting. You can see that uh, the Moran go to the market and they start trading on coat, goats. And what they do is they sometimes exchange. They exchange, they do pata trade, and the type of negotiation is very intensive that you don't want uh, the noise from the goat. So you just have to hold it between your, your, your legs. In the process, you, you get a better deal. This, this, when you go to the market sometimes in these traditional communities, you, you can learn quite a bit. But what, what this example on the ground at Itrukana is because of the World Food Program engagement with a company that normally imports a lot of peanut butter feeding the refugees in uh, the Western, in the, in the Kakuma refugee camp. And we have employed the same, same technologies of capacity building, food analysis and utilization, and con so that we could get most of these uh, pastoralists adopting it and supplying the market that has been availed by some of the private sector partners. So these are some of the, uh, products that after validation we got, varieties that have got high oil content and protein content and very low uh, aflatoxin content of between two to six parts per billion against 10 billion um, international required standards. This is one of the demonstration areas we had and training these communities is quite challenging. In most of the cases, you must employ translators because you can't speak their language. But the beauty, once the crop is established, they become excited and they quickly adopt them. And slowly by slowly, they can increase their income uh, based on the new technology. Here is also one of the examples where we had separate uh, Moran converted into agropastoralists 
and we also had women on one other end harvesting their own crops. And most of this straw now, of course, the harvest index looks a bit low, but if you cannot, you, there is no problem because they have their dairy goats, the goats that they milk around the compound for their children. So these are some of the outcomes that they, 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 when women are left after conflict migration and you introduce uh, a technology that they like, they will always have multi-use in terms of uh, the whole product utilization. Um, we also learned quite a, a bit in terms of community technology adoption by communities. Uh, farmers produce increase. Farmers produce a uh, increased community productivity. If because like now you see what was happening here, this was a communal uh, land that the community decided to produce together. They didn't have any water, so they were cutting water from the from the from the water pans, and they could do it together, watering patiently until they produced the crop. So such community shows that the, some, in some of the areas, like in Adoto, where there was good governance and leadership and organized communal labor, technology was easily adopted together, especially when you introduce groundnuts, and then later on we introduced uh, sorghum, you could see the level of happiness among the communities, and eventually such, such now scaling up require that governments invest on the infrastructure I talked about, because this is just a pilot. For them to be highly commercialized, there is need for further investment to allow more water. So these are some of the examples of uh, diversification. I talked about uh, the women harvesting groundnuts slowly by slowly, and it damages their fingers, and this is serious. But as you go on, you get to have drying facilities for them, and later on, shellers to even assist them to shell what has been produced. Because right now, shelling a kilo will take forever. So there is need for an integrated approach. As new technologies come in with higher increase in volume, and quantity, there is need to provide additional services and, of course, additional other mechanized systems to assist them even move the crop from the farms to the store and even from the store to the market. So there is need for motorized and equipment in the process. Um, this is these are just examples of some of the numbers increase in terms of beneficiaries of the, of the varieties we introduced at different sites. And you can see seed rates, part of the training, and even giving them expectations in terms of what they will get if they adopt the technology. So the achievements from this uh, fairly very wide uh, discussion or talk is that they, we saw some peace building around technologies, innovations, and agricultural practices, and community systems. We saw these crops to be, they were, were among, including the pasture, highly liked by the communities. The total numbers are here. The farmers that participated, and even extension staff that we worked with, and at this time, uh, the, the farmers that became innovatively active and they are now scaling up and finally the community trained staff that they have adopted in terms of TOTs. Uh, this is the systematic approach, just the diagram, the graphic approach of how we integrated. As a university we are here, we are working with national and international research groups for most of these technologies we have. And then we work with farming communities. Within this, we bring in agro dealers and stockists. And we have quite a number of, when you go to the ground, you have a lot of NGOs that still also work with the national and international groups. 
and then we have product services like like the weather weather services that come in we also utilize it and distribute we give them direct to the industry or consumers or even farmer uh, local farmer organizations so this is our integrated approach we 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 you for if you are a recite technology to go into the community there is need to have most of these uh, collaborators in conclusion, um, as I finish, our pilot collaborative studies and approaches show that innovative agricultural technologies can be adopted by small-scale farmers in dry lands of Kenya, which we've shown in Kenya, in, in Africa, and we've shown it in Kenya. Such efforts can immensely contribute to food nutritional security, which is still a big problem in Africa. It can also be a source of this building, resilience to climate change, which is becoming so serious. But at large scale, more resources and efforts are needed, and it should be taken up by more governments, more international donors and partners to alleviate the, the problem of poverty and insecurity in the drylands of Africa. Several factors, in our view, contributed to this success, especially in the Gerio Valley. The integrated approach we talked about, which looks across, including the culture of the people and including the niche piloting and also what technology is like, highly liked by farmers and what do farmers have, both in terms of the traditional knowledge and also what can you improve in terms of jam plasm collection within the community and you can help them to utilize it, to use it in terms of source of genes or genetic resource. The climate smart innovation technologies and social design implementation engagement is very crucial. That is one of them because social designs like the women who in some communities, they don't work with men. And some of the um, some of the activities are highly require a lot of a lot of um, men input. So there is need for social designs to take care of that. The deployment of participatory breeding, which was our key contribute driving factor, and crop improvement, that was our niche area of strength as, as a research group is what actually brought us to get some of these technologies integrated within the farming community. But combination of community analysis, research and community-based uh, production system to avail the first selection faster was also key. Community seed banks to reduce costs and increase access because we know private sector have not invested in these areas. And the reintroduction of the local accession and breeding program, is the sorghum and pasture, is very important to enhance and increase uh, scaling up of some of these technologies. Empowering farmers and value chain actors through information, research, and agribusiness skills and markets is key. And we saw two successes through the private sector of Insta, which was supplying groundnut to communities in, in, uh, through the World Food Program, through the um, um, uh, World Health Organization also, which is participating in taking care of the refugees, provided a good niche market for the Turkana. And also the Green Forest is a company that is buying what the new technologies or varieties will produce. And we saw also the coming in, in terms of sorghum for the East African brewery, which is a company that is making the low, took up the local varieties of sorghum varieties produced here recently. And quite a number of fabricators and shellers and people also who work in the ICT. For sustainability, more resources are needed to scale out these technologies. Science and experience will be great drivers. We also saw the need for leadership and social, cultural and political initiatives in the drylands. But more studies are needed, especially in the social cultural setting of communities in the dryland. This is a missing gap that we found uh, social investments and the impact of ICT and even use of phones and even tools in these areas, what would impact or add as agricultural technologies that are also not part of the things we study. I think I need to stop there. I've taken quite a bit of time and uh, I want to acknowledge quite a number of my colleagues I think Miriam Charimbu is uh, our postdoc from Michigan State, working with uh, Susan Witch. Uh, is, I think she should be in the meeting, in the room. 
Uh, my other colleagues in the university, Ikrisat Partners and uh, the Calro Group, the University of Nairobi also, our donors and the government teams, county government teams in many of the counties have talked about. Thank you so much. And uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Um, if there are any, thank you so much. And uh, thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kemerto, for a very important talk. We have questions. Uh, audience members, if you want to uh, ask a question, you can also raise your hand by use, using the raise hand feature, and then you can be allowed to unmute and speak. But we already have some questions. You can Yes, see I can them. go to them. Yes. Go. This is coming from Jennifer, I think. Jennifer Olson. What is the latest about using GMOs in Kenya? Will this affect your research or these arid or these arid communities? I, I guess. Yes, thank you, Jennifer. This is um, not long ago. I think a month ago, the new government of Kenya actually lifted a ban on the GMOs. The GMO uh, story was banned some time back, ten years ago. Kenya was fairly advanced at that time on the utilization of GMO. But there was a story, a publication from, I think, a French scientist who actually published something about causes of GMO that is highly related to cancer. But later on, that paper was withdrawn. There's been a lot of debate in Kenya about GMO. The truth of the matter with my also some knowledge in GMO is that the lifting of the ban was to allow further debate, further testing, and further evaluation of the GMO products we have. In my view, in my view, uh, this was the best decision the government made. Because initially for the last 10 years, all the scientists in Kenya were actually paralyzed. You could not do anything and discuss GMO. You could not get research funding on GMO. The government were in, investing uh, on GMO in very slow, low levels. And the products, including maize, cotton that had been tested were put on. So it is not going to affect, actually it's going to enhance. Uh, so Jennifer, the, the impact of the GMO issues in Kenya we is going to support uh, the dry land work that we are doing because we need other crops. Although my thinking about maize is that Kenya need to negotiate more on uh, maize because uh, maize in East Africa is cross-pollinated and within East African communities, maize moved from Uganda to Kenya, to Tanzania, to Ethiopia, and back to Congo and also from Congo to ERC all over. And there is also high seed production of maize in East African countries by Kenyan seed companies. So that one is something that I think maize will stay a little bit until we agree with the East African uh, communities. But for the cotton, for the cassava and all those, I think shortly they will be produced in Kenya. I uh, can see another question. Uh, what is the price and marketing potential of millet and sorghum? Yes, this is a very good question. The price and marketing. We have now seen for the last 10 years, increased prices of millet and sorghum because of changes in food preferences, especially for the high end or larger, the more richer communities are now going into the traditional sorghum and millet for their food consumption. Because they know it's highly nutritious. They have they could buy calcium, they are, uh, they, 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 they have, um, they have uh, medicinal value and diabetes and all these uh, HIV uh, diseases, lifestyle diseases, and even uh, all these lifestyle diseases and challenges that we have in our health are being known to be sorted out by millet and sorghums. And therefore, when you go to, when you look at the market trends, uh, Jennifer, they have been increasing. 
compared to maize, uh, a kilo of maize in Kenya, when there is optimal production, is sometimes uh, 20 shillings. That is around 20 shillings per kilo. Sorghum and millet rarely come below 50, especially the millets. So it is the this dryland series have got one to one and a half times the price. The only challenge is we have not created enough research. We've not invested enough in terms of research. The way the maize research started in the 60s in Kenya, and we've not put in enough resources for the drylands where most of these crops are being produced. Also, you mentioned that you are able to engage young women in cropping. Please describe. The, the way we engage the young men in cropping, in production, in the, in the, especially I could mention the beans, I could mention the groundnuts and some bit of sorghum. It is true. What happens is that when you start to take something new to the community and you deliver it properly through proper introduction, proper demonstration, engaging the youth to be part of your demonstrators, and you, you put them in the process, eventually, when, once they are trained and they see there is market, and the market is quick to bring money for the youth, including even shell, the shellers, we doesn't necessarily stay for a long time without the youth earning, they, they, they come in. So it is, it is true, we've had quite a number of young people joining in some of these demonstrations and they are part of the commercialization now in, in, uh, in the crops that they adopted. I can see from Susan, can you say more about the technologies, especially the non-digital ones and their potential to address some of the problems you mentioned? Yes, uh, thank you, Susan. I, I am sure that um, the non-digital ones would include um, mainly seed varieties. It would also include um, uh, mechanized equipment that some companies or some SMEs brought in. It would also include the nitrogen and bio fertilizers we introduced, and also some of the biopesticides that we tested with our post with our postgraduate students to control the insects that we say they are a problem, including the storage pick bags that uh, is a technology of um, the U.S. technology for the pig bags where you store your grain and you reduce oxygen significantly until all the weevils and even the larger grain borer, which is serious in, in, in the drylands, suffocate without, because you created anoxic conditions where there is no oxygen. So those are the, the mainly the non-digital non technologies, but the digital ones are the phone-based. They were mainly, uh, information on the weather station on the weather that came from the National Meteorological Station for the different counties you are working at. So every time we could send, we form WhatsApp groups for the farmers, and then you could send the information about the amount of rainfall expected in their area, and they could make decision on what crops and when to plant. I hope I've answered that. The potential of the of the of the Digital, the way I saw, including the potential to create market using digital technology was of course very impactive. But the non-digital, including the farm machinery, also was what the farmers actually adopted eventually anyway. And that is what remained in the community. Uh, I can see Steve Bishop. What is the role of increasing access to water or making existing access more sustainable? And I said, the drylands, the household has got 800 to 1,300 um, 
um, liters of water per year per person. In the developed or in improved count cities in Kenya, people can access up to 2,000, 3,000, or even more. And therefore, um, the water is critical in terms of irrigation, in terms of um, availability of drinking water for livestock, and even for the irrigation of crops we talked about. I see no open questions. So the, the thank you so much um, for the, the written question. Maybe if there are more other questions, um, how are you can allow the audience to ask me. Yeah, thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you for answering those questions. Susan, I think you're muted if you would like to, to speak. I just wanted to thank Paul uh, for speaking at the Ion Africa. I know it took us a few months to finally arrange this and it's nice that it's happened. And I, I, I deeply enjoyed your talk and thank you for answering all the questions. Thank you, Susan. Uh, thank you, Susan, and thank you for creating this. You are the initiator of this collaboration. Eribu. Yes, thank you so much. Asante Sana. Okay, Leo. Yeah, I, I I just want to to thank you as well for for this um uh, this amazing presentation. It looks like the, it must be quite an extended project, going a very multifaceted, lots of objectives, and and it's a it's a pleasure when uh, uh, when we can have projects like that that are more holistic in finding solutions than. These are the projects where you just go target a little uh, a little thing and you don't look at uh, lots of dimensions. Uh, you you develop you are developing crops or breeding crops and you're going into the field and 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 working with farmers and underground and you're help helping link them to markets and you're doing technology. So and then I just wanted to say it's it's very informative and. And you're, you're finding real solutions that will pro hopefully be transformative for people's lives. So thank you very much for sharing this work. Thank you too for joining in. Just know that it is um, work that has taken quite some time. And therefore, um, of course, you can't do it within a short period of time. Uh, it has taken a long period of several projects put together, but follow up projects on. on on uh, one crop, looking at uh, the synergy between the other one and uh, seeing what the communities also want. Otherwise, thank you so much for the appreciation. If there are no more questions or comments, we thank you again very much, uh, Professor Komoto, for coming and sharing a very important work. And thank you to the audience for coming. We'll see you next time. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, and our pleasure. It was a pleasure. Uh, thank you, Awa, so much. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.